Messenger on Facebook. And we will be reading out the questions at the end of the presentation of our two speakers. So I'm uh, Mars Imasa. I'll be moderating this uh, webinar on COVID-19 in pregnancy and children. Um, the general objectives of this webinar is to discuss the impact of COVID-19 to pregnant individuals and children and with the following specific objectives to describe the epidemiology of COVID-19 in pregnancy and children, to discuss the approach on handling pregnant and children with COVID-19 and to enumerate the safe and effective forms of interventions to manage COVID-19. The webinar will be recorded and will be available at the following FB pages. The Department of Health, Philippines, and the Philippine College of Physicians. So let me first introduce to you our speakers. Um, the, our first speaker is Dr. Maria Angela Rodriguez Bandola. She is a clinical associate professor at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, Division of OBGYN Infectious Diseases, University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. She is currently the training officer of the Division of OBGYN Infectious Diseases and the section chief of the OBGYN Infectious Diseases section of the St. Luke's Medical Center, Bonifacio Global City. Um, she was the past president of the Philippine Infectious Diseases Society for Obstetrics and Gynecology. She will be followed later on by Dr. Annalisa T. Ong Lim, who is a professor and division chief of the Infectious and Tropical Disease Department of Pediatrics, College of Medicine, Philippine General Hospital, University of the Philippines, Manila. She was the immediate past president of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines. She's a clinical trial investigator in a number of vaccine trials in children. And she's a sought after national and international speaker on pediatrics, infectious diseases, vaccines, and clinical trials. So, to start with, let me now um, uh, ask Dr. Angela to start the presentation on um, pregnant women. All right, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to um, thank the PCP and the DOH for inviting me to give this talk on COVID-19 in pregnancy. So we'll go through this um, lecture this morning using this outline. We'll talk about an overview of COVID and um, the impact of COVID on obstetric care. We'll talk about the diagnosis and management of COVID and pregnancy in pregnancy and the new normal in OBGYN practice. So what do we know about COVID-19? Now this coronavirus um, is caused by SARS-CoV-2 and is an acute respiratory disease presenting um, with influenza-like illness that can progress to pneumonia and ARDS. Now, as OBGYNs, we um, may catch patients in any of these stages from asymptomatic all the way to the critically ill presenting as shock and ARDS. The transmission of, um, of COVID-19 is um, known to be through respiratory droplets um, generated by coughing and sneezing and through contact transmission with contaminated surface. Um, droplet transmission refers to transmission over short distances via the droplets from the respiratory tract of one individual directly onto a mucosal surface or conjunctivae of another individual. The maximum distance for cross transmission from droplets has not yet been definitively um, determined, although a distance of one to two meters around the infected individual is most commonly cited. Um, studies have shown that the coronavirus present, um, persists on different surfaces for an extended period um, of hours to days. And so we cannot overemphasize the importance of regular cleaning and disinfecting these surfaces. Aerosols refer to particles in suspension in a gas and particle size of 5 to 10 micrometers follow airflow and is potentially capable of short and long range transmission. Now, in the context of the healthcare setting, there are aerosol generating procedures that require a higher level of um, PPEs that the um, 
physicians must um, use when performing these procedures. Now, the International Society for Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology has given several webinars and have included that the second stage of labor, um, vaginal delivery and cesarean delivery as possible AGPs that should require appropriate PPEs. Now, recall that the second stage of labor is from push in the pushing stage when the patient is fully dilated until um, the baby is delivered. So when we, this is the time when a woman working with their uterine contractions conduct a valsalva maneuver, filling the lungs with breath and um, pushing down on the diaphragm. And this is considered to be an aerosolizing event. Now, given that we know that COVID-19 particles can remain in the air in an enclosed room for up to three hours, um, there is a danger in the delivery room. Additionally, um, the initial research has found that um, there's presence of the live COVID-19 virus in stools and conjunctival secretions. Therefore, blood secretions and excretions, including stool from patients with known or suspected COVID-19 should be regarded as potentially infectious. I'm sure everyone who's rotated in the OB delivery room has had to um, deal with splashes and also having to clean the patient's perineum of stool during the second stage of labor. So what are the pitfalls in the care of an obstetric COVID positive patient? Now there's very much, there's very limited data on COVID in pregnancy. Um, there is the asymptomatic carrier that we have to deal with and the very nature of our practice, there are a lot of unknowns and uncontrollable factors. So emergency surgical procedures are always in the back of our minds and we usually end up having to deliver our patients um, in an emergency setting, and of course, the exposure to potentially infected bodily fluids. Now, what exactly has been the impact of, of COVID on obstetrical care? Now, uh, like I said, these are not normal times, and with very limited data to work with us, we don't have a playbook, we don't have templates to copy from. So most of the recommendations are very fluid and have been based on information from previous outbreaks and basic infection control practices. Now for antenatal care, the top priority is really prevention of spread. No? So with the enhanced community quarantine, most of the outpatient clinics were closed. Just recently it was lifted and as such we're starting to open our clinics. Now the default would be telemedicine um, in terms of handling our, um, following up our patients. No? So face-to-face -face consultations were reserved only for urgent concerns and were conducted at the OB admitting section. In that area, um, social distancing was observed. Um, there were also um, makeshift dividers or other precautions and PPEs were used for the face-to-face -face consultations. So this is a sample of our telemedicine setup that we recently employed to follow up our patients. And it seems like it's a very good um, medium to also for triaging patients if they needed to go to the ER or not. Now, the American College of OBGYN and the local society, Maternal Fetal Medicine, has proposed revised prenatal care schedules. So instead of the monthly visits, there were um, specific age of gestations where um, they re we recommended um, bundling of care. So if a face-to-face -face consult was to be done, it should be timed at the um, during like, for example, the dating of the ultrasound would be best at 11 to 13 weeks. And it was also at that time that we would request for initial obstetric laboratories. The next checkup would be at 20 weeks where a fetal anatomical scan would be done as well. And so you can see here that there is a decrease in the, um, <clears throat> an alternate antenatal timing, uh, visit timing for patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. Routine ultrasound, um, the schedules were also um, um, altered to maximize perinatal diagnosis and exposure risk for both patient and the healthcare provider. So a single third trimester growth scan was scheduled at 32 weeks. And if the patient has placenta previa or low-lying placenta, um, a repeat scan would be at 34 to 36 weeks. 
ultrasound examination for emergency cases, so for the first trimester, only um, if the patients are presenting with vaginal bleeding or pain, also for the second and third trimester. Now for high-risk pregnancies, especially those with comorbidities, the biophysical score or the Doppler velocimetry is only performed if it is essential in the decision-making and management of the case. Growth monitoring and fetal aging as much as possible. If it will not have any impact on um, the decision making, it is deferred. So this is an example of um, an ultrasound setup in the COVID-19. So for the scanner, the scanner is in PPEs and um, must wear goggles and 95. Um, gloves and protective gown at all times. And a plastic barrier was set up separating the patient from the scanner. And this is disinfected after each scan. Of course, hand washing after each procedure is practiced. The machines, you see the monitors are all wrapped um, and the probes are de um, disinfected after each use. The patient is, must wear a mask at all times and advise to cross her arms over her chest to avoid touching the bed. Now, this is the recommendation of the Philippine OBGYN Society with maternal fetal medicine. And you can see that even high-risk pregnancies, they've increased the interval between scanning and follow-up. So if your patient has controlled diabetes mellitus, you don't have to see them every month or every two weeks and can extend even up to every six weeks. Same for the chronic hypertensives and those with um, multiple pregnancies and other diseases. For fetal surveillance testing, so twice weekly NSTs are reserved only for growth restricted babies with abnormal Dopplers. And NSTs are limited in terms of doing it less than 32 weeks. So for those um, lower risk patients like advanced maternal age or BMI more than 40 with no other comorbidities, we just recommend fetal kick counts instead of doing a regular NST. So same recommendations, it's a good table to advise our obstetricians on how frequent and when to do the um, non-stress tests and um, when to just rely on fetal kick counts. So kick counting is used by the patient. A non-reassuring count provides the, um, gives us an alert that we should see the patient and um, do further investigation. So we generally advise our patients that 10 distinct movements in a period of up to two continuous or interrupted hours is considered reassuring. Telemedicine, again, so we've asked some of our patients to acquire a fetal Doppler. Now, these are very cheap and um, are available even in Lazada or Shopee. And it's also another way for us to monitor our patients remotely. And they feel pretty much satisfied with this um, um, type of monitoring as well. So other pregnancy-related services that could be delivered via telemedicine aside for, from virtual prenatal care would be at-home monitoring. So for the weight, the blood pressure, so you can recommend our patients to have um, their own BPs or if they're diabetic, have their own feet, um, glucometers. Consultations with other subspecialists like um, maternal fetal medicine specialists or a friendly cardiologist or endocrinologist can be initially done via telemedicine. And postpartum, the visits and lactation and breastfeeding support can be delivered via telemedicine. Now we go to the triage of patients, um, on the obstetric patients. No? So um, triaging them for going to the hospital or not would minimize or eliminate all unnecessary contact with the patient, um, of the patient with the hospital or the birth center to optimize social distancing. And we have to educate our patients that um, only urgent obstetrical issues should be seen at the ER. Now, we have a dedicated labor and delivery room or an area in that uh, labor and delivery room dedicated to COVID-19 patients. So this is just an example of a screening questionnaire that we give our patients. So it just checks for symptoms, history of exposure, and um, history of vaccination, and the area where they live. And periodically, we give this to them to just do a symptom check, and they send this back to us. And then we are able to assess where we have to examine the patient, whether in the clean 
um, area or in a um, suspect area or COVID area. So we check for symptoms. And um, even, well, we've incorporated the loss of sense of smell because we were able to pick up um, a pregnant patient with anosmia and that was her only symptom and she turned out to be positive. So one of the studies that um, we found um, very um, interesting was published by the New England Journal of Medicine. And between March 22 to April 4, they looked at 215 pregnant women um, for labor and delivery admission, and they tested them for SARS-CoV-2. Now, 1.9% um, um, of those patients were symptomatic and tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. But very alarming was that there was a 13.5% asymptomatic COVID positive um, group. Now these um, three of them developed fever postpartum. Now for most of their patients, 84.6% um, were asymptomatic and COVID negative. And eventually one of them became symptomatic postpartum and a repeat test three days later showed that turned out she turned out to be COVID positive. And as such, um, we looked into possibly recommending um, screening for all pregnant women for admission. Now, what is the rationale for screening? Um, it will allow us to identify asymptomatic pregnant women and initiate infection control um, precautions like isolation. It allows us to conserve the PPEs for those who are confirmed negative for COVID and also provides direction for well baby and nursery care, breastfeeding recommendations and mother baby interaction. So the Philippine Infectious Disease Society for OBGYN together with the POGS um, came up with an algorithm recommending screening for all pregnant patients. No? So if they're symptomatic and they, we know they're COVID positive, then they're managed as such. If they're symptomatic and unknown, um, they still undergo the, um, the COVID test. No? Um, those who are asymptomatic and unknown COVID-19 status, and they are for elective C-section, the recommendation is to do an RT-PCR five days before scheduled surgery and advised home quarantine until scheduled elective CS. If they are for vaginal delivery, um, we recommend to do an RT-PCR at 37 weeks and advise home quarantine after two weeks, uh, for two weeks or until spontaneous labor occurs. Um, for those who come in imminent or um, with unknown status during delivery, then um, these patients undergo a swab upon admission and are managed um, accordingly. Okay. So this is the recommendation in my in the private in our private hospital. So if they undergo elective C-section, they're screened five days prior to CS. If undelivered um, by 40 weeks, a second screening is done. And emergency consultation at the OBAS, they're done on admission and the patient is triaged accordingly. Mm -hmm. So um, prior to um, doing the, um, I mean, the PIDSOG recommendation, there were some institutions that were doing routine x-ray prior to admission. Now the predominant findings on x-ray um, would be peripheral airspace shadowing on a plain chest radiograph and bilateral multilobar ground glass opacities or consolidations on CT scan. Now the apprehensions on doing radiation um, on pregnant women, it's very low. So there's really no risk for increased risk for fetal anomalies or pregnancy loss. However, um, there is um, the POGS and the PIDSOG statement is that um, the use of radiologic imaging is not recommended as a screening tool in asymptomatic to mild cases. But of course, it's essential or indicated for moderate to severe cases and with severe deterioration of respiratory function. So other advice for our patients um, would be that they discontinue work or begin working from home a minimum of two weeks prior to um, anticipated delivery and to practice strict isolation during this time. When they go for prenatal checkups or in labor and delivery, we the visitation or the, um, the accompanying person is limited to one 
if um, if possible, and that we limit the movement of these women from one care area to another. So the dedicated labor and delivery room, and there's only a few um, healthcare workers. So if, for example, you're the attending physician, you're obliged to stay with the patient until she delivers. Okay. Now we move on to um, setting up the operating room or the surgical system. Now, the DR complex was um, retrofitted to take care of COVID-19 patients. Now, so we have to take into consideration the current infrastructure of our healthcare, our hospital, the resources available, the volume and the nature of patients and the overall capacity in handling the obstetric cases. So it's advised that um, we develop a, co a, a designated COVID operating room or area. Now, depending on the number of rooms, um, it can either be a separate area altogether, or if not, the farthest from the um, entrance would be your dedicated COVID OR. And if you only have one OR, the recommendation is to reserve the last cases, um, the last cases for your dirty cases. Now, adhering to the minimizing of transport of patients, we recommend that the patients recover also in the OR until they're ready for transfer in their rooms. During transport, um, we advise the, um, the team to keep the pathways clear. So close coordination with the elevator and the security um, should be done prior to transporting these patients to minimize delay in transferring. So these plans are very fluid and dynamic depending on um, the volume of patients in your hospital. Okay, so this is um, a very useful um, tool that we had to make sure that, that the physicians and the patients and the nursing staff know where the patient will go depending on the COVID status, depending on the nature, if it's preterm for delivery or for, for just a, an ultrasound check. So um, having this um, algorithm will very much be helpful in implementing infection control practices and minimizing um, transmission. So in the Philippine General Hospital, we mapped out um, the patient flow so that um, everyone in the healthcare team, even the ancillary services know where the patient should pass. So this is the process flow for COVID positive patients or um, those who are suspect or probable. Um, and there are designated COVID theaters. You know that you know that there's only one, um, a unidirectional flow for the physician. So after performing the procedure, there's the doffing area, there's the shower room and um, the pathway leading out to um, the uh, elevator area. So this is just pictures of how our um, operating room is set up in the PGH. So you note know that there's an anteroom where there where the babies are handed to the pediatricians and also if they're the circulating nurse, if there's anything that's needed inside the surgical suite, then that's where it is handed off. But most of the time you have to make sure that everything that you need in the OR is already inside the in the operating room. So you note here that the anesthesia machine and all the other, even the lights are covered with plastic and the bins are there and the HEPA filter is also there. So this is a picture of the nurse's station and the doffing area, the shower area, and the OR12 was converted into a room with clean clothes. And this is where the physicians would pass through after doffing and taking a shower and exiting. So this is a picture of our MAB OR in St. Luke's Global City. So this is the assessment area where an ultrasound, a dedicated ultrasound and a non-stress test is set up in the MAB OR. Um, and this is how the NSD um, is conducted in the delivery room and in the cesarean, a cesarean section as well. So this is an innovation um, done by um, the Baguio General people where they, of course, anticipated that there is a high risk of aerosolization um, during the second stage of labor. So um, an expanded version of the intro box um, to protect um, the healthcare workers. And this was also replicated in Vicente Soto in Cebu. 
So now we move on to discuss, um, discussing briefly um, COVID-19 and pregnancy. Now, pregnancy is a physiological state that predisposes women to viral respiratory infection. And due to changes in um, the immune system and cardiopulmonary systems, pregnant women are more likely to develop severe illness after infection with respiratory viruses. Curiously, though, um, there is no evidence that pregnant women are more susceptible to COVID-19 infection and that those with COVID-19 infection are more prone to developing severe pneumonia. Now, they've postulated that there are some changes in the hormonal milieu of pregnancy, which influences immunological responses to viral pathogens, favoring anti-inflammatory cytokines. And this seems to be the predominant immune response to SARS-CoV-2 in pregnancy, resulting in lesser severity in these individuals. Now, um, like I said, there are very few um, data available for uh, maternal and perinatal outcomes, but we found um, a systematic review of 108 pregnancies published in um, March of 2020. And what they described was that uh, most of these patients, these pregnant patients um, delivered via cesarean section and the indication was for fetal distress. There were six who underwent vaginal delivery. Um, most of these patients had fever and cough during um, admission and lymphocytopenia and elevated CRP was noted in these pregnant patients. There were no maternal mortalities reported in this um, meta-analysis uh, systematic review, and there was note of one case of vertical transmission. So this was their conclusion that although a majority of mothers were discharged without any complications, severe maternal morbidities and perinatal deaths were reported. They still had could not rule out vertical transmission and that careful monitoring of pregnant patients with COVID should be done. So um, they're mostly asymptomatic or mild, and there's no vertical transmission. These are the earlier reports. Now, there were absence of viral isolates in amniotic fluid, cord blood, breast milk, and neonatal throat swabs. But they did note that um, feta, um, neonates um, from COVID-19 positive um, mothers um, had um, miscarriage, they had growth restriction, and preterm delivery. So recently, this was um, came out in May um, 8, 2020, they were able to demonstrate um, SARS-CoV-2 in placental and fetal membrane samples. So I think there were two um, babies who were positive for COVID um, and their mothers were positive and they were able to document it also in the placenta. But they recommended to await further um, reports um, to um, conclude if there's really vertical transmission. So maternal outcomes, preterm delivery, they were at higher risk for cesarean delivery for fetal distress and comorbidities like preeclampsia. Okay, so um, a study um, published um, looked at COVID-19 infection among asymptomatic and symptomatic pregnant women. This was um, uh, in New York City. And what they found was similar to the previous um, studies where women would come in Average age would be 37 weeks. They would have fever, cough, and myalgia. And um, what was interesting was that there were two patients out of the 43 patients who um, were COVID positive no, on admission. 32.6% um, were asymptomatic and 67.4% were symptomatic. Disease severity pretty much mimics the general population. Most are mild at 86%, um, severe at 9.3%, and only two.
um, sorry, we apologize. We lost audio of Dr. Angela. Let, let's let it, uh, give us time to fix this so we can proceed. Okay, um, I guess we'll have to uh, move on to the next speaker for the meantime, if Dr. Angela will not be able to uh, fix uh, the audio at her end. So, yeah, we'll, we'll go back to Dr. Angela in a while. Um, can we now move on to... Our next speaker, Dr. Anna Ong Lim, to talk about uh, COVID-19 in pediatrics. We'll go back to Dr. Angela after we've uh, figured out what's wrong with her presentation, with the audio of her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Anna. Please, thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Let me just uh, call up my slides. Okay. So thank you to the Philippine College of Physicians for this kind invitation to share um, COVID um, issues in children. Um, I will be covering a fairly broad topic. Are my slides showing? Not yet, Dr. Can you try again, please? Okay. There you go. We're okay. good. Thank you. So I will be sharing a fairly um, broad topic, and I hope you'll bear with me because I'll be covering um, some key points for both uh, infants and children uh, as they are really covered in the entire pediatric age group. And what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to just answer a couple of key questions. What is the current situation and what are the what's the impact of COVID-19 in children? How does COVID-19 present in children and what can be done for this uh, age group? So um, this is a map of what's been happening globally. And you will see that uh, based on the number of uh, recently reported cases, we fall within the mid range of reports coming from all over the world. And uh, the Western Pacific region to which the Philippines or under which the Philippines is classified uh, represents 3.6% of total cases and 2.1% of total deaths. So certainly uh, not as much as what has been reported in other parts of the world, but still a substantial burden given the, um, that mostly lower middle income countries are in this um, region and uh, any new diseases are expected to pose a substantial burden for uh, the already stretched healthcare system. This is what the Philippine situation looks like. I know most of us have been actively following this. So we've been told that uh, the numbers are quite reassuring. The curve has been flattened so that we are now transitioning into a 
uh, modified ECQ and even a GCQ in some areas. But I think what bears looking at is actually the fact that the Philippine data, if you will look at these numbers and the slopes of the curve, actually reflect more of uh, what's happening in NCR. And I guess the message here is that if we can pose a good intervention or propose a good intervention in NCR, then we really have a substantial, we will make a substantial impact on the number of cases um, being reported. So um, the WHO also uh, looks at age and sex uh, based data and this uh, graph, although this was actually um, shared last month, shows that in comparison to the older age groups, we have very minimal burden of disease in um, the pediatric uh, cohort. And the proportions of cases age zero to 19 years are actually stable over time. It is the age group between 20 to 39 years um, uh, that has been steadily increasing. And maybe this is reflective as well of the fact that this is the age group that will more likely be um, going out of the home um, for work and other activities. In the Philippines, uh, the age and sex distribution reflects uh, the global data as well. And you will see here that the younger age group represents um, a minority of all the categories. Um, under 300 cases, confirmed cases have been reported in the pediatric age group. And uh, in the latest version of the DOH database, there have been eight deaths. So let's go now to the second question, which is how does COVID-19 present in children? Um, the, the local professional uh, medical societies have collaborated to work on a clinical approach to the management of COVID-19 in pregnancy and newborn and the newborn. And um, it is available in different portals. I got this particular version, the May 7 version from the PIDSP website where uh, in this um, web link. The algorithm focuses basically on what to do for either the suspected, the confirmed, or the probable COVID-19 mother and talks about how delivery should be approached as well as how neonatal care should be carried out. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about this part of the algorithm as it is the one that mainly concerns children. So one of the more significant changes that have been brought about by COVID is basically um, the concept of separation, um, particularly where the mother's status is not yet well-defined. This is based again on the concept that vertical transmission has not really been uh, demonstrated conclusively and the assumption is that if the infant were to um, catch COVID, it will probably be from the adult contacts either in the hospital setting or the healthcare setting or from the mother. Um, testing is optimally done for the mother prior to delivery. But if this has not been done, then the 14-day duration that is usually quoted for different um, uh, situations is also the same that is utilized for the duration of separation. So there is a recommendation to separate for 14 days from resolution of symptoms or from clinical improvement or 14 days from the last significant exposure if the mother is asymptomatic. Testing is also recommended, specifically if the mother is uh, found to be COVID-19 positive. Or if the mother has been classified as suspect or probable, 
um, and the suspect or probable uh, COVID-19 mother becomes positive uh, or symptomatic, then the baby should also be tested. Breastfeeding um, is managed slightly differently because we want to ensure compliance with standard and droplet precautions should the mother opt to breastfeed. Alternatively, expressed breast milk can be offered. The routine hearing and newborn screening tests are delayed, but can still be done prior to discharge when feasible. Early discharge is still recommended with a follow-up in two to three days and an observation period of 14 days post-discharge to assess for symptoms that might be associated with COVID. So here you will see that the previous dictum of um, uh, having the mother-infant diet together for as long as time as possible and as early as possible has been interrupted by the need to isolate the infant from the probable suspect or the confirmed mother. Although there is still room for shared decision-making for grooming in and direct breastfeeding after discussion of the potential risks of transmission. So I would also like to share with you, so that guideline actually is reflected in this page as um, this algorithm, the approach to management of COVID-19 in pregnancy in the newborn. There's another algorithm that looks at screening assessment and clinical management of uh, pediatric patients. And the main feature is actually this algorithm that walks the clinician through the clinical encounter. The initial step is to triage the child and determine whether the the child actually might be suspected to have COVID from a combination of signs and symptoms, exposure evaluation, as well as laboratory evaluation. <clears throat> so the key features to check for are the presence of influenza-like illness or the presence of criteria uh, consistent with severe acute respiratory infection which is basically a combination of ILI and a requirement to be hospitalized because of severity of symptoms. Now, what are the symptoms that we expect in children? We've been told often that they're mainly uh, mild presentations, very difficult to distinguish from the regular respiratory tract infection, and in some cases may present with a picture consistent with pneumonia. Diarrhea has been pointed out, as has been the presence of rashes. Lately, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC, has been reported in various um, US and European publications. And the case definition includes um, symptoms that can be consistent or that can be similar to um, Kawasaki disease without an alternative plausible diagnosis with um, proof of SARS-CoV-2 infection through RT-PCR um, serology or antigen test. Now, uh, I would hasten to add that the serology being quoted here is not the rapid testing, but rather the laboratory-based antibody detection test. So some patients are said to fulfill the criteria for Kawasaki disease, but it is distinguished from KD because of the more pronounced inflammatory symptoms as well as the association with uh, exposure to a case of um, COVID or a laboratory uh, proof that COVID infection might have occurred within four weeks prior to the onset of symptoms. The largest database remains to be the one that has been reported from China. And out of their 100, rather 171 confirmed cases of uh, COVID 
this table was generated showing that the median age was 6.7 years. Most of the cases um, of these hospitalized cases presented with pneumonia, but the main um, cluster of symptoms was usually a respiratory tract infection. A fairly large number was also asymptomatic. It's important to note that contact was usually traced to an infected family member. Fever was present in the majority of cases. Other common signs and symptoms included cough and pharyngeal erythema. Diarrhea was found in about 8% of cases, with nasal symptoms found in, a in the minority at 5 to 7%. Imaging uh, features or imaging has been mentioned as a possible tool to identify patients with COVID-19. Uh, however, in this case series, about 7% of radiological, uh, or rather of patients had radiological features of pneumonia without any symptoms of infection. So this might be a feature, but uh, albeit with limited usefulness. This um, figure shows us a summary of the signs and symptoms that I mentioned. Again, the most common being cough and fever, but also including uh, shortness of breath, sore throat, rhinorrhea, vomiting, and diarrhea in smaller numbers of cases. Lymphopenia has been pointed out to be a common feature in adults, but unfortunately, it's not usually found in pediatric patients, uh, it's only been identified in 3.5% of cases as of the time of the generation of this report. So after having gone through um, the signs and symptoms, we check for exposure. And uh, exposure is defined in the standard manner um, where a close contact uh, is assessed to be one where there is face-to-face -face contact with an identified COVID case within one meter for less than 15 minutes without proper uh, use of PPEs. Intrafamilial spread is something that has been pointed out repeatedly in many reports focusing on children. Um, in the U.S., approximately 90% of cases reported from children were associated with household or community exposure. And this diagram basically shows what happened in Wuhan where initial community spread eventually found its way into households either through exposure of pregnant women or um, in clusters within extended uh, families. Now we go to laboratory evaluation. And it's important to note that although WBC counts vary, um, leukopenia, Leukocytosis, lymphopenia have been reported. One other thing that we might want to take notice of, particularly in the Philippine setting where dengue is a differential for an acute febrile illness, is that thrombocytopenia has been reported in some adult cases initially thought to have dengue fever based on just positive dengue serology, but later on uh, being identified to be COVID positive utilizing um, PCR. So the take-home message here is that if you are uh, trying to differentiate between dengue and COVID, you cannot depend on dengue serology for a diagnosis of dengue. It's more important or rather more advisable to utilize your antigen detection test to establish diagnosis of dengue. Chest x-rays in children have been shown to have findings similar to that of adults. Unilateral or bilateral patchy infiltrates uh, in the periphery with severe cases developing multiple ground glass opacities have been reported. Consistent with viral, uh, with patterns uh, similar to viral pneumonia. So let's look at what can be done for children with COVID-19. Since most of the reports focus on children presenting with mild illness, home intervention is very important. And most cases will not really require 
hospital interventions nor will laboratory confirmation um, be readily available again because um, of the mild presentation and really because it doesn't change management. Therefore, supportive care, prevention of transmission, and monitoring for clinical deterioration are the key um, points to emphasize for uh, caregivers of children. This sample symptom monitoring form is found in the guidelines and can be reproduced to guide parents to monitor these particular signs and symptoms uh, for their children and note any deterioration which should be promptly reported. Isolation uh, will likely be needed in the home setting and instructions for caregivers should be given uh, about face mask use. Um, it's important to remind caregivers that children younger than two years should not wear face masks because of the risk of suffocation. And for the child older than two years, it's also important to find the right size so that um, its barrier function can be properly utilized. A caregiver um, is assigned for young children and it's important to select one who has um, no comorbids so that undue risk is avoided. The caregivers are also advised to wear surgical masks so they can be protected and should also use gloves when handling secretions. Hand washing is emphasized as is avoiding direct contact with the child's secretions and stools. Cleaning, cleaning and disinfection of surfaces uh, should be taught to these caregivers, as well as attention to, pre to prevent accidental ingestion and poisoning, which has been reported in several instances from our local uh, emergency rooms because of um, um, mislabeling or rather um, inappropriate um, utilization of containers for household cleaning products. Laundry can be an issue in the home setting and um, care is recommended for handling as well as for uh, the actual um, use of um, bleach solutions as well as um, hot water and soap. When is home isolation to be discontinued? Basically, the simplest guideline still remains to be the WHO recommendation of completing home quarantine for 14 days after the solution of symptoms, particularly in cases where no PCRs were done. And this is actually um, consistent with the different um, recommendations. Also from, um, or this has been adopted by um, DOH, but um, there is still currently a recommendation to wait for at least one negative result, although I understand this recommendation is being harmonized. There are some children who will present with severe or critical disease, and these are identified as those presenting with respiratory difficulty, sepsis, or septic shock. And for this group of children, of course, um, ICU care is recommended for appropriate support. Um, the diagnosis of um, COVID-19 in children also um, is similar to that of adults and is primarily done utilizing the PCR. Resampling can be done if the initial test is negative and the suspicion for COVID-19 remains. i just like to share with you this algorithm to support um, the guidance to actually not prioritize rapid antibody tests. Um, there is a uh, administrative order that attempts to guide rapid antibody testing for particular risk groups. In this case, for example, for asymptomatic patients or healthcare workers with a relevant history of travel exposure, 
and you will see that um, the bottom line for this particular group is actually to quarantine for 14 days. Now, if um, for some reason rapid antibody tests are employed, you will see that for both arms, regardless of the result, you will actually end up also still isolating for 14 days. And only in the case of those who are IgG positive will um, the algorithm uh, management change because instead of quarantining for 14 days, then you might actually want to consider the patient to be presumed recovered and discontinue quarantine. In the other group for which antibody tests can be considered, which is symptomatic patients and healthcare workers with exposure, again, this group should also be quarantined for 14 days or admitted as appropriate. And once again, you will see that the recommendations are still just the same. You end up with the same intervention, which is isolation for 14 days. <clears throat> so I guess my bottom line here is that even if you do your rapid tests for these risk groups, you don't change your management. Considerations for treatment include a caveat that investigational drugs are still being recommended or rather are still being utilized for either adults, uh, for adults and clinical trials are underway. Because of this, experimental agents are only recommended for severe critical cases. Prophylaxis is not recommended at this time because again, um, experimental uh, drugs are being used. So um, in the la latest version of the guidelines, we still continue to um, provide some guidance for hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine plus azithromycin, vitamin B3, and zinc sulfate. But with the caveat that there is a lack of high quality evidence that this is effective and safe. Other antivirals like the pinavir, ribavirin, or sitanivir do not have sufficient evidence Corticosteroids should not be routinely used, but can be helpful in patients with a hyperinflammatory state. IVIG can be evaluated or can be used, as can the other immunomodulators such as ocilizumab or even convalescent plasma. Therefore, management, or rather, although we have focused on um, management specifically of those who are uh, suspected or probable COVID uh, cases, the other arm of the algorithm also talks about what to do with those whom you discard as non-COVID. And the focus basically is to treat for what you feel is or what you think is the current illness, but still to reevaluate if there is no improvement or worsening status so that the patient can be managed accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anna. Um, we really apologize earlier. Uh, Dr. Angela, I think, uh, uh, was cut off from the Zoom meeting. So we'll resume with her presentation. Dr. Angela, please. All right. Um, are you able to hear me now? Uh, clear. Okay, good. So I think I got cut off in this um, slide. No? So we're talking about maternal and perinatal outcomes of, with COVID-19, um, a systematic review of 108 pregnancies. So I'll skip through these um, data and go to the conclusion where um, they had 18 articles um, reporting 108 pregnancies and they described women presenting mostly in the third trimester Similarly um, to the non-pregnant um, patients um, presenting with fever and coughing, lymphocytopenia and an elevated C-reactive protein was observed and a staggering 91% of these women were delivered by a cesarean section um, for fetal distress. Now three maternal intensive care unit admissions were noted and there were no maternal deaths reported. There's one neonatal death and an intrauterine death was also reported. So they feel that um, severe maternal morbidity as a result of COVID-19 and the perinatal deaths um, are um, an indication that patients who are pregnant with COVID are at high risk for complications. Vertical transmission of COVID-19 could not be ruled out with this report. So 
very good that um, patients with COVID who are pregnant are mostly asymptomatic or mild. Um, in earlier reports, there was no rec um, report of vertical transmission. So there was absence of viral isolates in the amniotic fluid, the cord blood, breast milk, and neonatal throat swabs. Fetal complications included miscarriage, intrauterine growth restriction, and preterm birth. However, lately they've been coming up um, reporting cases. So there are case reports of um, babies who were COVID positive, um, babies of infants, I mean, so sorry, babies of mothers who are COVID positive having also um, symptoms and um, they were able to detect SARS-CoV-2 in the placenta and fetal membrane sample. So this was published in May um, of 2020. So maternal outcomes, aside from preterm birth, um, they were at higher risk for cesarean delivery and preeclampsia. So looking at um, this report um, in New York, among um, patients who were asymptomatic and symptomatic, they found that similarly they presented with fever and cough. And um, what was interesting was that um, a majority of these patients were asymptomatic, 32.6%. No, um, I mean, so for the symptomatic 67.4, most were mild infections. However, there was there were two cases that required ICU admission. So the Philippine OBGYN Society with the Philippine Pediatric Society came up with an algorithm, an approach to the management of COVID-19 in pregnancy and the newborn. And if these patients who were COVID positive were not in labor and were stable, they could be sent home. No? So these um, mild cases could be sent home for quarantine with proper instructions and counseling with um, coordination with the RESU. Um, antenatal surveillance would be every two to four weeks. Now, for mothers who required admission, um, they are designated in an, um, placed in a designated isolation room. Um, antenatal surveillance is performed, and um, it is also a good time to counsel these mothers on the birth plan, the care of the newborn, the feeding options, and the risk of transmission. Now, for critically ill mothers, um, they're admitted in isolation rooms, placed um, ideally on left lateral decubitus position and um, with adequate hydration and BP monitoring, making sure that um, the O2 sat is maintained at great, equal or greater to 95%. So they're pretty much managed the same way as the non-pregnant patients. They, um, these are the baseline laboratory tests that we order. Um, and depending on the clinical picture, um, it, when indicated, then an extended panel of tests are done. For therapeutics, they receive the, pretty much the same medications as the non-pregnant also. So antibiotic therapy for CAP, moderate risk. So these patients, it's safe to give ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Um, lopinavir and ritonavir has been used extensively in HIV um, pregnant patients. So it's category C with no evidence of teratogenicity. Anti-malarial drug, uh, the anti-malarial drug hydroxychloroquine is category C and has been found to be safe for use in all trimesters with of course some concerns on prolonged QT interval and arrhythmias. Another promising drug, um, remdesivir, was used for MERS-CoV patients. So this is a broad spectrum antiviral drug and is currently in phase three clinical trial um, for COVID-19 in the US and China. And I believe here also in the Philippines, we have some sites um, that have joined this trial. We had um, a case uh, where who received low molecular weight heparin um, for VTE prophylaxis and also um, for severe cases. And vitamin C and zinc supplementation is added as well. Now for those in labor, if the patient is preterm, um, it is advised that we consult a specialist in terms of initiating use of antenatal corticosteroids for lung maturity. Tocolysis is generally avoided. Um, if only to delay delivery um, to administer antenatal steroids. If the patient is term and for vaginal delivery, um, we recommend continuous electronic fetal monitoring and to expedite delivery prior to the onset of severe maternal respiratory distress um, uh, yeah, and fetal distress. For the postpartum care, our patients remain in the operating room until ready for transport 
to their um, fight to the ward or their rooms. No, and the dictum really is to try to discharge them as early as possible um, with coordination with the resu. Neonatal care, I believe, was um, discussed already earlier by Dr. Ong Lim. So for patients who um, are to undergo elective cesarean section, we schedule our patients at 39 weeks age of gestation if they're clinically stable and emergency cesarean section only for obstetric indications. Patients undergoing vaginal delivery, again, continuous electronic fetal monitoring, we limit the number of um, he um, healthcare workers exposed to the patient. So the attending physician is asked to monitor the progress of labor at bedside. Epidural anesthesia is recommended. Now we want to make sure that this um, is adequately placed and there's adequate pain control. Um, we don't want to have to convert into a general anesthesia if not necessary. Um, skin to skin contact, immediate latching is discouraged. And again, the postpartum stay may be shortened with the goal of decreasing exposure and risk of spread and transmission of COVID-19. Postpartum consideration, so transmission after birth via contact with respiratory secretions is a, is a concern. And so temporarily separating the mother from the baby to reduce risk of transmission is employed, either in separate rooms or if they have to room in um, and it's not feasible, um, we use a physical barrier or it's recommended that the newborn be placed more than or equal to six feet away from the mother. And the mother is advised to put on a face mask, practice hand hygiene um, when handling these newborns. There appears to be no risk of vertical transmission via breastfeeding. No virus was um, detected in the colostrum of COVID-19 infected mothers. So if the mothers um, intend to breastfeed, we should um, get consent for expressed milk feed, uh, breast milk feeding. Um, a breast pump, um, a dedicated breast pump is recommended and should be disinfected after each use. Timing of delivery. So for COVID-19 positive patients um, with mild or moderate symptoms not requiring immediate care, um, the obstetrician is reminded that the severity of the disease peaks in the second week. So planning the delivery prior to the peak of severity of the disease is optimal. For elective cesarean sections, delivery should be delayed if possible when a woman is no longer infectious or scheduled prior to the peak. So it's a case-to-case -case basis. Manner of delivery, cesarean section is reserved only for obstetric indications. If there's decreasing, deteriorating maternal condition, um, difficulty in ventilation due to the gravid uterus or fetal compromise. Expediting the delivery via oxytocin augmentation and amniotomy um, to prevent um, and facilitate labor already. Um, for the second stage of labor, we recommend assisted vaginal delivery with forceps or um, vacuum extraction. For preterm pregnancies, as previously stated, steroids, um, routine use of steroids should, be, um, um, should not be done and that we only um, give steroids in consultation with an MFM and infectious disease specialty, specialist. Um, use of tocolytic, so it should not be used in um, an attempt to delay delivery in order to administer antenatal steroids. So magnesium sulfate is used for neuroprotection for pregnancies less than 32 weeks or for eclampsia prophylaxis. Now there's no reported data regarding the impact of magnesium sulfate in the setting of COVID-19. There are potential concerns about respiratory complications like pulmonary edema, or dyspnea and should be used judiciously in the setting of severe respiratory symptoms. It can, however, be used in patients with mild to moderate symptoms. So I think this was already presented earlier, so I'll skip through this. And um, just to share with you some experience we have in handling COVID-19 in pregnancy in our two institutions. So we have um, 13 cases um, of COVID-19 positive um, pregnant patients, 61% of them were symptomatic on admission and 385 of them were asymptomatic. Most of them thankfully were mild and there was one um, critical case. Comorbidities, uh, bronchial asthma, hypertension, diabetes, and um, one was obese. 
12 out of 13 received um, antibiotics. So for CAP moderate risk, two received um, hydroxychloroquine and um, because of pneumonia. So they've had findings of pneumonia in nine of 13 cases. So we have 12 delivered, 50% of them underwent cesarean section and six um, another six delivered via vaginal delivery. So the indications for cesarean section were for repeat, for malpresentation, and for fetal distress. Outcomes, we generally had good outcomes. So they presented um, in our OB admitting section at average age of gestation of 35 weeks. We had good weights. Most of them were um, term but we did have a set of twins, two fetal deaths in utero and 11 live births. In St. Luke's Global City, we, had, we have five so far. Um, two of them were remote from term, so 15 and 17 weeks. Symptoms, anosmia, um, cough, and there was one that was asymptomatic. Two delivered vaginally and one for emergency cesarean section for maternal indication. Now, this patient had comorbidity, so she was hypertensive and was hypothyroid and had a, um, a more critical course than the others. So what is the new normal like for OBGYN practice? No? So it's likely going to be a combination of telemedicine and face-to-face -face consultations. Um, we have started to open our clinic. So this is um, a picture of a clinic in St. Luke's Global where there has to be um, alcohol-based hand sanitizers readily accessible for the patients. Our secretaries wear PPEs as well. Um, there's, we have to create an area um, and prepare the facility or the clinic. No? So create an area to physically separate patients. So ideally patients are placed six feet apart. If the facility lacks a waiting area, then a designated area or partitioning is done. And to reduce crowding in waiting rooms, some can even consider advising patients to stay in their vehicles until they're called for an appointment. So OBs are very much prepared, they're PPEs. So we have PPEs in the clinic. Um, and also until such time that we have a vaccine and we have good medications, I think this will be the new normal for now. So wearing PPEs in um, the OR and the OBGYN complexes. This is how our delivery room looks like. And so in summary, we've discussed um, prenatal and postpartum care modifications like altered prenatal checkups using um, telehealth, bundling of tests, so ultrasound and laboratory tests, restricting visitors, retrofitting our DR complex. I've presented to you the pog spid sog algorithm for COVID-19 and pregnancy. Management of the COVID pregnant patient was discussed and the new normal for OBGYN care. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Angela. Uh, if you have questions, can you type them in as uh, uh, I think Migo is screening all the questions that will be answered by our panelists. So let me start uh, some of the questions that are directed to, let's start with Dr. Angela. There are a number of questions here. I guess uh, some of them were uh, also uh, covered in a way uh, during their presentation. Uh, okay. Um, first question is uh, for Dr. Angela, would pregnancies complicated by comorbidities such as hypertension or GDM have increased severity of COVID-19 infection? And uh, related to that, uh, in, in managing pregnancy in this setting, how close do you advise follow-up and what do you advise patients as absolute warning signs to have consult at the uh, OBDRER. And uh, I guess this is also related um, uh, depending on the recommendations. What if uh, we, patients do not have some of the equipment that are being utilized in telemedicine? Um, okay. So, well, first, I'm looking at the question of Dr. Jan. Is, yes, is this yes, yes. Okay, so for um, management of preg high risk pregnancies, now those with comorbidities, hypertension, and diabetes, now these have been found to be um, 
more likely to end up in a more um, severe course of COVID-19. So how close do you advise follow-up? So the recommendation for high-risk prenatal care um, was presented and recommended by the Philippine Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And depending on the control, um, every four to six weeks is the recommended interval for following up these patients. You advise these patients, of course, the warning signs of the 10 danger signs, headache, vomiting, nausea, bleeding, fever. These are the danger signs that we instruct our patients to go to the OBDR and ER for assessment. Um, alternatives for monitoring in cases where patients are unable to do telemedicine. So there are different platforms. No? Um, even prior to COVID, patients have had access to us in terms of Viber messages or our secretaries. So there's um, very little in terms of um, a barrier right now in consultation. So if we don't have a platform, Facebook Messenger or Viber is a good tool. Um, fetal mo movement counting is what we recommend if they don't have their Dopplers or um, glucometers. No? So pretty much the same for um, pre-COVID times. Uh, any other? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm trying to look for the other questions. Yeah, uh, there are some more questions here. Let me just uh, read them out to you, Dr. Angela. Uh, first question is, uh, uh, the next question here is, does intrauterine fetal death in a term gravida add significant risk for uh, undiagnosed SARS-CoV-2 SARS infection? Should she undergo SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing prior to admission is and then the other question is crying in infants and children and aerosol generating behavior i guess uh, dr anna can also share uh, her opinion about this so i'll ask so yeah so um for our for our experience in pgh there were two fetal deaths in utero and um our, the current recommendation and being followed at pgh and at st luke's global is to screen all pregnant patients um, with PCR testing on admission. So this is what we recommend. So it's, it's you know, we still don't have um, hard evidence for adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes, but there seems to be an association with severity of COVID-19 disease and um, fetal adverse neonatal outcomes. So, uh, Dr. Anna, there's a question here on crying in infants and children. Uh, is that an aerosol generating behavior? Oh, I'm trying to recall if I read anything specifically about crying. Parang it's not described as something that people have looked into as aerosol generating. Um, but maybe associating this with the more recent evidence that says that even speech is something that can transmit or yeah. that can generate droplets, then I would think that crying being a more forceful behavior would probably be uh, the same way. No? Um, but I guess one thing to, to emphasize here is that in many studies, children have not been shown to be efficient transmitters. In fact, I recall one Dutch study where they modeled the number of people infected by particular age groups and the ones coming from children are really small. You know? So um, uh, again, I think the focus really be, sh should be on symptomatics uh, and adults, symptomatic adults, right? Okay, uh, can, can I go back to Dr. Angel? There's one more question here. Is it really safer to deliver at home during this pandemic? Well, um, Home they, deliveries. <laughs> well, I mean, they've found already that there's an increased risk of fetal distress for COVID-positive pregnant patients. So um, delivery at home, whether pre-COVID or non-COVID, it's safer to deliver in an institution. Um, and it's really more of strict, uh, strict infection control practices in the institution to reassure our patients that they won't contract the disease while admitted. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were a number of questions uh, that were directed to Dr. Anna, which she already answered by chat, but I guess uh, the rest of the uh, attendees would also be benefit from the information you provided in the chat. Uh, although I think uh, some of these questions were also answered uh, earlier. Uh, breastfeeding recommendation for COVID mothers. 
okay. just to Very emphasize. Yeah. yeah. So for breastfeeding, the critical issue is actually to, to determine whether the mother is to be considered as a as a case. No? So if the mother is asymptomatic and doesn't have a relevant exposure, then we don't consider her to be a transmitter and therefore you would need to manage uh, that uh, delivery in the usual or that breastfeeding scenario in the usual manner. Now for those who are symptomatic or who are already tested to be positive, um, an emphasis is being made for shared decision making, particularly to talk to the mothers about uh, the fact that we don't really know much about transmission of the virus through breast milk. So they should be aware that there is this risk, although it's probably very small, that, that the infant will get something from the breast milk. Or uh, the more real possibility of getting something from the mother uh, directly because she is symptomatic or already positive at the time of the breastfeeding encounter. Now, if the mother still opts to breastfeed, then she should be utilizing uh, precautions, you know, barrier precautions, so that she doesn't transmit um, uh, the disease the infection to the baby. Another option is to use donated breast milk. Okay. Um, how about the, there's a question here. What vitamins can we give to strengthen the immunity of our children, particularly those one to three years old? Uh, would you recommend any supplements? So um, in the guideline that I shared, those were actually vitamin D and zinc for vitamin D3 and zinc as treatment. Um, there are no recommendations for prophylaxis, no recommendations for supplementation to improve immunity against COVID-19. So I guess um, uh, if you were in the habit of already providing vitamin supplementation for your child patients uh, because you determined that their nutritional intake was suboptimal, then you can continue to do so. Okay. Uh Earlier, you talk about risks uh, on the use of masks in children, because uh, I have three kids. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think this concerns me, not as a physician, but as a father. So what, what would be your recommendation? I'm not talking about, of course, uh, uh, them already being exposed to one who has COVID, but let's say when they do go out, uh, would you have any recommendations on the use of masks? Same as the general population, no? actually we started off from a very different paradigm. Alam nyo nung simula, di ba? Walang mask, right. mask. Tapos ngayon lahat mag-mask na. Right. Right. So it said, it's the same recommendation, I guess with the additional precaution to make sure that the kids don't get suffocated. Kasi yung problema nga with young children, pre-verbal, they can't really tell us what they're feeling. So we have to be observant. And if they're not able to give us feedback that they're actually having difficulty breathing, then it's not safe to give a mask or let them use a mask. Oh, would you recommend a uh, face mask? Or let's say just they, they, they just go out, you know, they don't go to uh, crowded places. Would face mask be sufficient? Or yeah. would you still recommend surgical mask? Oh, okay. So typically we say for lay individuals so that we reserve the uh, supply of surgical masks for healthcare workers, both masks should be appropriate. They just have to be laundered regularly. Okay. Mars, there's a lot back. of questions about, sorry, Mars, there's a lot of questions yeah. about rapid testing. And I think, um, do you mind if I go ahead and address Yes, please? yes, yes. Can you answer them, please? Yeah, because um, there's really this whole controversy about rapid testing now. And I think as clinicians, as uh, people attached to public health agencies, we really have to be very knowledgeable about what these rapid tests are supposed to be doing and uh, what they're meant for, and the limitations. So first of all, please let's remember that um, there is no recommendation at all from any medical society that supports the use of rapid antibody testing because um, their uh, sensitivity and specificity is extremely limited. Um, there's the issue of false positive tests because of cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses, we know that there are seven currently identified, four of which are uh, commonly circulating. So we don't really know whether any of those rapid tests have been demonstrated or validated um, to not cross-react with these um, 
uh, commonly circulating coronaviruses. The other question of uh, is false negativity because um, there have been instances where uh, patients who are already identified to be COVID positive by PCR uh, have tested negative on antibody testing, especially because of the consideration that antibodies appear quite late in the course of the illness. There are studies that say that you can actually start identifying them beyond day 10 and even beyond day 21. So um, it's very difficult to interpret these positive tests. Now for the ones, the questions raised in the chat where the mothers have been tested, utilizing rapid antibody testing. So again, coming back, or coming back from that perspective that rapid tests are not recommended, we should actually not be making clinical decisions based on the results of the rapid tests. So regardless of the rapid test, the um, um, recommendation still is to utilize the symptoms or the exposure history as your primary determinant as to whether the mother needs to undergo a PCR test. Now, having said that, many facilities now do PCR testing of all of their deliveries. And in such cases, um, uh, if the mother is subsequently identified to be PCR positive, then that's a situation where you need to also test the infant. Okay, uh, I think there are a number more questions here. Uh, let me see. So you, do you advise visits to hospitals to continue routine vaccination for healthy children? That's, so uh, there's, for, yeah. Yeah. there's actually a guideline now that says uh, we still need to pay attention to these vaccine preventable diseases. But of course, with due caution to avoid um, exposure uh, for our um, well children. So some of the mechanisms that have been proposed are to schedule uh, well visits from uh, sick visits, uh, to do telemedicine so that the child is evaluated beforehand online and then the actual clinic encounter is very brief. Um, clinicians are being counseled about how to disinfect their clinics more thoroughly so that they don't un uh, unduly expose kids. So um, the answer is yes, vaccinations need to be provided. Um, and yes, clinicians need to be aware about how to avoid um, exposure for their patients. Okay, uh, how about for Dr. Angela? There are a number of questions here. Uh, what advice can we give our gravid patients who opt to deliver in lying in clinics manned by midwives due to financial reasons? Well, um, it really is a choice, no? So I think there should be some, I think POGS has currently engaged the midwives in terms of teaching them basic infection control practices um, and when to refer. Um, unfortunately, I think there, there are some areas where they also use the rapid antibody testing. So we are getting referrals in PGH for those who are positive for IgG and IgM. And, you know, so it's, it's a bit, we really need to reach out to the midwives also. So, of course, patients should be counseled about safety and um, the need for infection control in their deliveries. Oh, okay. Uh, I think there were also a number of questions uh, related to trainees, uh, OBGYN, and I think uh, pediatric residency training. So, uh, are are they uh, resuming their duties? Uh, do we have any measures to minimize the risk of exposures? I guess these are some of the, I think, points that were raised here. Dr. Angela? Or... Uh, our residents are still on duty. They perform the deliveries for those who are um, in PGH, um, those who are imminent or um, undergo cesarean section or ectopic pregnancies. For gynecologic cases, soon we'll be opening um, the um, clean ORs and the clean uh, will be open for clean cases. So um, hopefully we'll be able to catch up. In St. Luke's Global, pretty much the same. But in terms of didactics, in terms of lectures and conferences, these are being continued. 
Okay, this is one concern I have as well. Uh, this was pointed out by one of our attendees. So, what, uh, Dr. Anna, what are your thoughts on DepEd's decision to open classes in August? So, how can we protect our children and what are the precautions needed? Actually, I, I wrote in my own question uh, earlier. So, uh, does uh, the Pediatric Society have any, or, or are, they, are you coming out with any guidance regarding classroom attendance? Should there be further easing in the current restrictions? So um, we are starting to work on a guideline. The team has already been identified. We said that the timelines are a little bit more flexible compared to before because our target is August. Although I understand there's some schools that are still hoping to open by June. So pwede bang atin-atin na lang, huwag na muna tayo magbukas, ang hirap naman ito, dami na nating problema, pati yung school, uh, problemahin pa ba natin? No? But uh, having said that, there's actually also studies coming out saying that this uh, lack of access to education is also equally harmful, no? uh, especially if it's not judiciously applied, and particularly for areas where the case numbers are low, this can be really explored. Um, we will need to observe a new normal. Uh, we cannot have classrooms with 50 kids. You know, that's uh, given already. There will be a lot of uh, revisions in terms of how um, classes are conducted, how common activities are conducted. Uh, but I do hope that we will be able to get to a point where we will feel as parents that we will feel it safe to send our kids back to school because it is important for education and socialization. Yeah, I think there there's another question related to that. Um, so, any reminders or check checklist for school children in preparation to the opening of school, like what immunization they should have? Uh, any suggestions on PPEs? Okay, so the immunization is easier to answer, you know, because if any age appropriate, just go ahead and give it. For people who actually have not been in the habit of providing flu vaccines for their kids, I would say it's critical to do that now. No? Kasi, unang una, you don't want to be confused by uh, the overlap with flu and COVID in terms of symptomatology. And there have also been reports of co-infection, so you don't want to have that risk when it's vaccine preventable. Now, with respect to PPEs, um, for those countries where schools school has resumed, they provided kids with face masks and face shields. And I guess that's reasonable because what you really want to avoid exposure is exposure to the mucosal membranes. And, and um, uh, that would be helpful. Of course, kids need to be educated about frequent hand washing. Okay. Uh... I mean, just looking through a number of uh, questions still. Madami. <laughs> madami, madami, madami <laughs> talaga rito. Madami. Uh, okay. So I think we, we answered that about vaccination. And I think there was even a question on, uh, you know, there's this being advertised, you know, this necklace that uh, so, sort of... Uh, an, ionizer. Sort of an, yeah, ionizer. <laughs> Would you recommend that? I think there was a question on that as well. Okay, what do you think? <laughs> Why? Well, ganito, no? Kasi isipin natin, paano ba tayo nahahawa sa droplet, di ba? So, ano ba ginagawa ng ionizer? Supposed to be um, makes the droplet fall down faster. I think that's the concept. I don't really know whether that's scientifically validated and how will you be able to do that over such a large area that's... Um, um, where that particular droplet dispersal is happening. So I, I don't know of any validated study that says it really works. Dana, no, pero parang wala tayong evidence. Okay, uh, there's one more question here for Dr. Angela. Uh, I think there's a, a question on a mom who delivered and tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 but the infant becomes symptomatic although mild and subsequently suspected for COVID and testing is considered or done. How are they managed? I, yeah, think, I think Dr. Uh, Anna <laughs> can also answer this. Yeah. I'm sorry, you Mars. I, I lost track. Yeah, uh, this is a, uh, the case is uh, that of a mother who delivered and tested negative for SARS-CoV-2, but the infant becomes symptomatic, although mild, 
and subsequently suspected for COVID and testing is was done or considered. So how are they managed? Is there oh. do they are they separated out in terms of breastfeeding? How do we go about while awaiting results? Oh, like last week, Louie, I was trying to answer it, eh, pero <laughs> hindi ko mahabol ang daming tanong. So oh, yeah. um, okay. uh, this is actually um, a case where you might want to consider separation, because the problem is you don't know what the status of uh, one member of the diet is. Um, although, if the mother is negative and the infant has no other contacts, uh, parang it will be quite unusual for the infant to be COVID positive unless yung kanyang source sa healthcare worker. Okay? Uh, but having said that, since hindi natin alam yung status ng one member of the diet, then they will have to be separated. And breastfeeding will have to be done uh, through other means, either utilizing express breast milk um, or um, donated breast milk para uh, continue the breastfeeding process. Okay, uh, there's a question for Dr. Angela. Yeah. Uh, it says here, RT-PCR is still not readily available all over the country and results are still delayed. So uh, the question is, can we modify the schedule of subtests prior to um, CS or EDC? Yes, I believe um, there are recommendations to change the um, date when you perform the RT-PCR for pregnant patients. So um, 37 to 38 weeks um, in general, depending on how, how quick the turnaround time is for the RT-PCR testing. For patients who are at high risk, those with history of preterm delivery, infertility patients, those with comorbidity, some of the obstetricians requested earlier because they anticipate that these patients will deliver much earlier. Um, I, there is a question here about do we have a separate, um, what do you call this, a separate OR or delivery room. So it depends on your institution. You can set up a totally separate. So in St. Luke's Global City, we utilize the MAB OR, which is in the ground floor for all COVID patients and unknowns, and the third floor for the clean cases. But in PGH, we only have one OR setup. So all patients are treated as if they're COVID positive. Um, we don't have elective surgeries for now. So this limits, uh, you know, this is not a consideration at present. There is some question also 37 weeks. Uh, to repeat, so the recommendation is so they do the test at 37 weeks. If they're undelivered um, in two to three weeks, then a repeat is recommended. So in that interval between 37 to 40 weeks, your patients are advised to stay home self-isolate and try to avoid exposure as much as possible so that when she goes into labor, the, that the results would be valid. Um, are asymptomatic pregnant patients considered less infective? We don't know. I don't know if that's the case. We still don't know the interval for infectivity, but I think it was like two days prior to onset of symptoms. Now that's when they are able to transmit. Um, Yeah, I think I answered pretty much more of the um, yeah. PCR testing. Uh, earlier, Dr. Angela showed us data on outcomes um, of pre women, pregnant women with COVID. And there, I think there was a significant uh, percentage of patients who had intrauterine fe uh, fetal death. Yeah, there, there were two yeah. cases. Uh, yeah, uh, and so I think there's a question related to that. So if you have a, now a patient presenting as a term gravida with IUFD, what is her risk that she's in, infected with SARS-CoV-2? Is uh, PCR testing more indicated? Yeah, so we those two cases um, were infants of mothers who were complicated. So that was the FDU, the first FDU, the mother um, expired because of diabetic ketoacidosis. And um, I'm trying to pull up the, the data, the... Okay, so DKA and um, diabetic nephropathy, acute kidney injury. So um, very complicated course. So this one we can't rule out if it's because of her medical condition or if because of the COVID patient. 
Um, and then again, the second FDU was a patient with chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, primary infertility, and total mastectomy for phylloidous tumor. So just an association, but no direct um, correlation yet at, at this point. So all patients are... Just a tangent. Continue, please. Um, there's some questions. Pa. Are there specific guidelines for sonologists doing ultrasound? Yes, there are. So the... Um, Philippine Society for Ultrasound in OBGYN came out with recommendations or guidelines to protect the sonologists, the care for the machine, the patient, and the disinfection of the room. So this was presented earlier. Uh, there's a question here on rate of false negative PCR tests among pregnant patients. Is same. It the same as, same as non pregnant, no. yes. The same, okay. So, for those women who undergo cesarean section emergency without a known status, they're treated as um, as COVID positive. So, they're brought to the MAB OR um, in St. Luke's Global if their status is unknown. And in PGH, since all patients are treated as COVID, they're all brought to the third floor for. Um, delivery with full PPEs. Have you guys gone to the mall? Because <laughs> they open up. No, you yeah. haven't. So I, you haven't. Yeah, I, I went one time because I was looking for a connector for my for my mic, and I saw several pregnant women in the mall. So, what do you think? <laughs> Well, uh, ko sa'yo risk? dapat, Mars, bawal sabihin kung pumunta ka na o hindi. <laughs> <laughs> Kahuli ka tuloy. But, well, this is, a, this is a threat. So we initially started screening middle of April and we were able to catch three asymptomatic pregnant patients um, who were COVID positive. And then subsequently, because of the quarantine, the ECQ, negative na most of the, uh, all of the patients. So this is good and reassuring, you know, both for the patient, the physician, and the hospital. But um, with this lifting, and of course, the disinhibition and going out and feeling like the virus is non-existent, we will probably encounter a significant increase in the number of COVID-positive pregnant patients. Okay. So I guess uh, do we have some more questions here. That uh, uh, some of them are related to what has been what have been uh, answered earlier. So on testing. So any uh, any last uh, statements for our attendees? So sorry, we will not be able to. I think. Uh, Accommodate yeah, some more. There's one here, Dr. Oh, okay. About um, the mother is negative, but the baby turns out to be positive. So they're find they're trying to find out if there is vertical transmission or if this is horizontal transmission or hospital acquired yata ang question nila from the healthcare worker. That was partly, I think, uh, answered by Dr. Anna earlier. Yeah, because um, we are not yet certain about uh, vertical transmission. Yeah. And uh, if the mom is uh, negative, then we may have to consider the possibility of exposure to the healthcare workers as well. Uh, I, I guess that was uh, brought up earlier. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess for some of these questions so I guess uh, later that, on. Siguro if I can add, Mars. Yes, yes, Dr. Anna. Oh, so I think it's quite critical also to understand that when we do our PCR tests, you know, there is still the possibility of a false negative result. So um, there are studies that have shown that even for the NP swab, which is the better test, you can only get about 60% um, uh, 
true positive. So, may, malaki-laki pa rin ang 40% na negative. No? So, let's assess whether clinically the negative result from the mom is actually um, clinically compatible. And then, uh, if we really believe that the PCR uh, from the mom is truly negative, then let's evaluate the infant for other exposures um, and, and consider that possibility na hindi kay mami nang galing kung hindi sa ibang mga household members or maybe even uh, hospital workers because um, that's uh, something that can happen. Yeah. Oh, there, there's uh, there's one more question here. I just saw it. Um, I think this is regarding vaccination and uh, pay, uh, let's say a child who happens to have some symptoms um, that you may suspect uh, possibility of uh, yeah slight fever and respiratory symptoms. Will you delay immunization so since uh, the symptoms may be related to COVID? In general, if a child is moderately to severely ill, you delay immunizations. If the child is mildly ill, then you may proceed with immunizations. If that was a case uh, that I saw in the clinic, and this is somebody whom I know is reliable, the mother, the parents can be trusted to come back, then I would delay just so that it's not difficult to distinguish between progression of symptoms for this illness versus a vaccine reaction. Now, in the public health setting, usually they will say if it's mild, there's no relevant exposure, then you go ahead and vaccinate. So it really also can depend on how you assess the parent's um, um, capacity to evaluate will be. Okay. I guess uh, some of these questions, let me see if there are still some open questions here. Okay, use of mask. <laughs> uh, do you use, I, I, I guess for, for um, uh, healthcare workers, for physicians, especially Dr. Angela, no, during procedures, do you use respiratory mask or just N95 mask in the OR? N95. Oh, just N95. Okay. okay. I think there are specific questions here on cases that they encountered. We might as well want to address this. Uh, uh, a patient, the patient is a frontliner but on leave since lockdown. She had an emergency CS. Initial rapid test was uh, false positive. So they repeat the IgM, and it was uh, that. Yes, where did that go? The repeat IgM was uh, negative. I, IgM IgG negative. Do you still have to do PCR test postpartum? Uh, if yes, when is the best time to do PCR? So patient is asymptomatic. I think so they did a rapid, yeah, rapid test, rapid test. So negative in result. Um, no, IgM, I think, IgG. No, no. A return the initial to work, was return to work recommendation. Yeah, it I guess so. Yes, their institution, their admin, eh, if they require PCR. I mean, if oh, they're going to sorry, require... sorry, Doctor Angela. I think the question here is that uh, they did the initial rapid test, uh, which was false positive. So they did a repeat IgM, IgG, which turned out negative. So the question here: so this patient underwent uh, emergency CS. Do you need to do PCR test postpartum? You have a patient who is asymptomatic, frontliner. Can I try to answer that, Mars? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so ahead, I guess and daming issues, eh, diba? Bintis, nakanak, frontliner. Ang tanong yeah. is, what are we testing for? What is the purpose of this test? Is it with relation to pregnancy? Siyempre, hindi na, nakanak na eh, diba? Tapos is it with relation to the fact that this person is a frontliner? Then if that is the case, um, the, the guideline to follow will be the institution's guideline. What do you do with your uh, healthcare workers in terms of um, regular testing when we consider them to be at risk? Uh, I don't think this has anything to do anymore with the pregnancy because, um, again, the pregnancy has already been uh, completed. And again, uh, 
whatever that IgM or IgG test was, in this case actually illustrates that it is so unreliable. Diba? Kita na nga natin ginawa, nag-negative, nag-positive, di ba na maintindihan, tapos in the end, mag-PCR ka pa rin. So, uh, syempre may cost din yan, yung anxiety, no? Uh, if it's so unreliable, I don't really think there's any place for it right now. Okay. Uh, there's one more here. Uh, related to uh, healthcare workers, so as a safeguard to both mother and baby against COVID-19, may I know when can residents in training go back to hospital after duty, after delivery? Let's say you have a pregnant resident uh, gave birth, so after delivery, especially if she's breastfeeding, when can she safely go back to hospital duty? Pretty much the same as non-COVID times. They they have this, um, I think, 60 days or 90 days, but that's the legal, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, guideline. But for resident, of course, if they're extended, um, then they extend for an extra number of months that they missed. But I know my batchmates, when they delivered in two weeks of vaginal delivery, they're back na. Too. So uh, it's quite different. Now, the return to work clearance for pregnant employees, it depends on your institution, what their recommendations are in terms of if they require RT-PCR before they resume work and every three weeks thereafter if they're tested and then if they're symptomatic, they go on quarantine. All these things are institution-based. Mars, can I just share something that we're doing in, in PGA? Yes, please. Yes. We have uh, a couple of residents who are pregnant, trainees who are pregnant or who are breastfeeding. And um, I guess the question here is, uh, are we putting them at undue risk because we're exposing them to a clinical setting where they themselves can be infected and this infection can actually be passed on to their infants? Mm -hmm. But it's actually the same setting for any healthcare worker. I'm sure we live with... <clears throat> Um, in extended households, we have elderly or people with comorbids in our households. And what do we do? Diba? Uh, it's either we opt out of clinical practice altogether so that we don't have to face that issue, or we are um, uh, taking care of ourselves so we don't pass on these uh, exposures, these risks on to our household members. Now, um, I don't think there will be any categorical recommendation for this. It will have to depend on um, uh, institutional guidelines. But the mindset will be, uh, kahit ano pa yung status natin as healthcare workers, because we don't live in a vacuum, we live in households, then whatever precautions we have to take to make sure we don't get sick and don't pass on, it should apply also to the pregnant or the breastfeeding uh, uh, decision. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anna. I guess um, the questions have all been answered. Uh, there were questions that I, I think were related to the ones we've already answered as well. So there was this question on return to work clearance for pregnant employees. That was, uh, I think, uh, that depends on the uh, guidelines uh, provided for by the company, but uh, for for and based on the DOH recommendation as well. So I guess that's about it. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Anna and Dr. Angela for sharing your precious time uh, for us to have this webinar. And I hope our attendees were able to learn a lot uh, from their experience, how they are managing patients, uh, COVID uh, in, in uh, pregnant patients, uh, children, particularly in these trying times. So uh, we have uh, recorded this uh, webinar. So if you have friends, uh, colleagues who want to view this, it's available again at the PCP FB page as well as the DOH FB page. So to everybody, thank you very much and hope that you can also attend another webinar due this Friday. Thank you. Thank you.